Hey everybody, Uncle Rich here for Who's Telling the Truth. Judy, can we have our Who's Telling the Truth bug up there? Let's see, this is show number 170. Today's date is April 10th, 2017, and the name of the show is Climate March. And guys, I know you're going to look, say, Rich, it doesn't say Climate March. Guys, I wanted to do the show on the Climate March, which is coming up on April 29th. But if I name the show that, the simple folk, like Uncle Joey, wouldn't watch the show. And guys, you're going to say, oh, you know, Rich, that's not fair to call Uncle Joey one of the simple folk. Guys, when it comes to a lot of these Republicans, Simple folk is being nice to them. Mark can be one question Friday. Uh, Guys, sometimes even the, the best laid plans go astray. And what are you going to do, you know? But anyway, it boils down to Trump thinks that he's going to be able to convince people that he's going to be able to revive the coal industry. Now I realize that this, this coming weekend is Easter, but Trump's going to have to pull a miracle <laughs> to resurrect the coal industry. And guys, that's as, simple, that's as simple as it gets, because the coal industry is, is we're going to prove to you tonight that it's a dead industry. And the next clip we're going to play is where Trump thinks he's and guys, you know, Uncle Joe, you can't talk to him about, you know, global warming. It's impossible. He thinks it's a hoax. The numbers have been fudged. He doesn't care. The only thing he cares about is the Republican Party. And this is what makes me crazy. And the next clip we're going to show you is from Robert Reich. And he's going to lay it down even more simply, almost in cartoon form, so Uncle Joey and the simple folk can understand it. So Judy, let's have clip number five, please. Oh guys, this is from uh, Janina. Janina, I'm sorry, I wanted to give you when a Donald shout Trump out. Donald Trump running for president. You. He talked a lot about putting people back to work. And one of the industries he focused on most was the coal industry. He even put on a hard hat and waved around a pickaxe to show how much he loved coal. But there simply aren't very many coal jobs to be had anymore in the United States. And that's not because of anything Obama did. The reason there are fewer coal jobs is because chart. of the coal industry. This used to be coal mining. This is coal mining now. In 1985, the coal industry employed a little over 178,000 miners. By 2016, it employed just 56,000. Coal Look jobs that, are decreasing because demand for coal is decreasing and because machines now do much of the work. By contrast, in 2016, Automation. wind and solar energy provided more than six times the number of jobs as coal. And the trend is even more jobs in wind and solar. And that's regardless of what Trump does. So show which you path do we want to take? Later, the coal guys. path, with fewer and fewer jobs each year, or the wind and solar path with more and more jobs each year. Here's something else to consider. Solar energy is exploding worldwide. Look at that six chart, Uncle increase Joey. In just the last five years. But America ranks fifth in the production of solar energy behind China, Germany, Japan, and Italy. If we really want to lead, if we really want to join the new energy economy, we have to go with the energy of the future, not the energy of the past. The other option, the one Donald Trump is proposing, leaves us following, not leading. It's our choice. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to lead or are we going to follow? Are we going to lead the world or are we going to follow the Koch brothers Corporate America and the 1%. And the choice is simple for me, guys. You know? Now, 
When you have a product like coal, it gets hard to sell it after a while. So, you know, you have to think of very inventive ways to go about tricking the simple folk. So, guys, what inventive ways would you think of <laughs> to promote coal? And we're gonna, the next clip we're going to show you, show you is from, it's called Hollow Men. Hollow, empty. Hollow Men. <laughs> and they want to sell you clean coal, smart coal, <laughs> and green coal. <laughs> so, Judy, video number six, please. What if we were to say that we were selling them clean coal? Yeah, unfortunately, there's a problem with that. <laughs> what? There's no such thing. Aren't we working on it? Yeah, but not with a straight face. It's a long way off in the future, but boy, it's been a fantastic distracting phrase. All right, well, what if we come up with another one? Please. What about smart coal? Well, what does that mean? Well, what does clean coal mean? Good point. But you can't call it smart coal. All right. Green coal. Coal's black. Yeah, but there's green tea and tea's black. Good point. <laughs> Green tea is black. Oh, yeah. Joey! <laughs> now, guys, we always talk about lobbyists, and obviously, coal has their lobbyists. So, we're going to show you how the coal lobby is against wind farms. So, Judy, let's have clip number seven, please. Judy! Holy mackerel. I'm Gregory Dawson filling in for Clifford Baines, who got a call back. Wind power is gaining popularity as a clean, renewable energy source. But is it dangerous? This week, the American coal lobby released a new advertisement warning wind turbines could blow the Earth out of its orbit. Let's watch. The Earth's orbit. All life depends on it. A little closer to the sun will burn up. A little farther away will freeze. But wind farmers want to install thousands of propellers onto the Earth, and propellers make things move. We like this planet. Let's not blow it away. Chilling stuff. So, uh, panel, is it time to reconsider wind energy? I think Definitely. we have to. I'll Definitely. admit, I always assumed that wind energy was harmless, but after seeing this ad, I am not so Some sure. Some leading scientists at Cole University recently took me out to dinner and told me about a study they had just published. It demonstrates how the sheer force of the new wind we're creating could accelerate the Earth's rotation so much, people will literally fly right oh, off like of it. Oh, like when you oh, spin a lazy goodness. Susan too fast and the pepper shaker slides right now, off? Now, the environmental activist group Americans for Mining-Based Energy recently released a documentary entitled Terminal Gust in theaters soon. Could movies like this spur the public to take a more critical look at the I, wind I industry? So. Well, I just I really happened do. to see a screening of that film at the recent Center for Coal Policy Conference in uh -huh. the Bahamas. Well, there is a heart-rending segment about a small town which is suffering from wind whistling into their water oh supply. Oh, my God. Kids could drink that water and get wind in These their brains. These big wind yes. fat cats have our country in a stranglehold. I'm tired of America sucking on the wind The fact feet. is, mankind is meddling with forces that cannot comprehend here. I'm like coal, we don't know what wind is. No. We don't even know where it comes wind from. Wind slips through your fingers. It's dishonest. It's like that slogan from last year, coal, energy you can clutch. Now, oh, the yes. coal yes. lobby has recently raised uh, concerns about other energy industries. Mm -hmm. uh, just earlier this week, they took out this full-page ad in the New York Times about how solar energy is sucking our sun The dry. American people have to stand up and start buying only environmentally sound coal-based products. Yeah. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I, so. I happen to have this delicious snack bar here. It's 100% natural coal. Mm. 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 It's yummy. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. Natural coal. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? Guys, it does. <laughs> now they have a coal energy drink. <laughs> So for those people that really want to get juiced up, clip number eight, Judy. What do you do when you get that 3.30 feeling? When you're too tired to work out? 
or you're just plain exhausted. Well, thanks to our powerful coal lobbyists and our innovative mountaintop removal specialists, we can all fuel up with Coal Energy Drink. It keeps me going, and it's 100% raw fossil fuel. Coal isn't just clean anymore. <laughs> it's refreshing. It gives me that short-term boost so that I don't even have to Look worry about my future. Bottle. Or hers. No more 330 feeling. In fact, I can't feel anything. <laughs> I drink it every day because it's really my only choice. Thank you, Coal Energy. No, thank the big utility companies for putting profits before your future health, the economy, and the planet. Ooh, gets me every time. Coal Energy Drink. Keeps you going till it all runs out. Guys, that's what it boils down to. Putting profits before people. And the next clip we're going to show you, the name of the clip is, What's Wrong with Coal? But guys, they would have done a better job if they would have named it, What's Right with Coal? Because really, I mean, when you start to think about coal is just bad jazz. I mean, from the way you have to mine it, to the way you have to ship it, to the way you burn it, to the residual effects, to the ash that you got to get rid it never ends. It doesn't end. But you know, you think that after a while, people would start to get it, but you get people like Trump that have built false hopes for these poor people. You know, he took advantage of them. He stole their votes. He knew he couldn't deliver. Nobody can deliver. When you're beating a dead horse, guess what? It's dead. It ain't getting up. You ain't going to revive it. Even Jesus can't save the coal industry. So the next clip we're going to show you, like I said, this clip should be called, What's Right with Coal? Judy, number nine, please. It's hard to believe that nearly 40% of our country's electricity still comes from coal, a dirty, outdated energy source. Coal not only causes health problems, but it's also the main contributor to climate disruption. Just how bad is coal? In mountaintop removal mining, coal companies clear cut forests and literally blow the tops off mountains to get the coal. This process dumps millions of tons of waste into our streams and poisons our drinking water. But mining coal is only the beginning. Burning coal generates smog, which can cause asthma attacks, chest pains, and breathing problems. In fact, one out of 10 children in the U.S. suffers from asthma, and it's the number one reason kids miss school due to illness. The pollution from burning coal leads to 12,000 emergency room visits and more than $100 billion in health costs every year. Coal pollution also contains toxic mercury that damages the nervous system and is especially dangerous for babies and young children because it can cause developmental problems. Mercury rains down into our oceans, rivers, and lakes, contaminating our fish and seafood. And even after coal is burned, the waste that's left over is bad for our health. Each year, coal plants generate more than 140 million tons of toxic waste called coal ash that's stored in thousands of pits across the country. Enough toxic waste to fill more than 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Living near a toxic coal ash pit can be worse for kids' health than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. The good news is that the United States has become an international leader in reducing carbon pollution, largely because we are retiring coal plants and replacing them with clean, renewable energy nationwide. The amount of electricity America gets from wind and solar power has more than doubled in the past few years. Iowa and South Dakota are already getting more than 20% of their energy from wind power. And in 2012, 10 states got more than 10% of their energy from wind. Coal is making us sick, and it's time to make this toxic, outdated energy source history. Let's create a clean energy future for our country and for our kids. Let's move beyond coal. Guys, it's not that difficult. You know, times change, technology changes. We've got to make the change with it. It's simple. And I mean, we're going to prove to you how wind and solar are really starting to take over. And as a matter of fact, even the coal companies are getting into solar. And you're going to say, oh, Rich, you expect me to believe that? 
Absolutely. I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. And the next clip we're going to play is a coal company that found that it's cheaper to get its electricity <laughs> with solar panels. So just so in Harlan County, an unlikely adventure. building is switching to solar powered energy. The Kentucky Coal Mining Museum in Benham is owned by Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College. As WYMT Sarah Anderson reports, school leaders are hoping this will cut down on their energy costs. Work has begun. So they'll just lay the panel on and move on to the next one. It's very quick and simple. To power the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum, not by coal, but by the sun. It is a little ironic, but you know, coal and solar and all the different energy sources work hand in hand. And, you know, of course, uh, coal is still king around here. Brandon Robinson represents Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College, who owns the building. We believe that this project will help save at least eight to $10,000 off of the energy cost on this building alone. So it's a very worthy effort All and it's going to save the, the college money in the long run. The project costs thousands of dollars, but bluegrass solar owner Trey Sexton believes it will pay for itself. I think that everybody knows that when we're talking about uh, attractions like this, these high volume, uh, low traffic, uh, you know, m uh, municipal attractions, that something has got to give with their expenses and their overhead. Sexton says an average home could be run by about 20 of these panels. Now that would cost about 17 to $20,000, but he says would pay off within five to seven years. Robinson says the money saved goes right back into the college. Of course, in the current economic times that we're in, any way to save money is always appreciated and helpful, especially that's money we can put back toward our teaching our students. Embracing new ideas while holding on to tradition. In Harlan County, Sarah Anderson, WYMT Mountain News. City officials say Benham Schoolhouse Inn leaders are looking into the project as well. So when the coal mining museum gets its electric from solar panels, things are starting to change. It's that simple. And guys, it all comes down to the money. People are starting to find out that it's cheaper. It's cheaper to use solar and wind than it is to use coal, oil, or gas. And the next clip we're going to play we're going to prove to you how many jobs solar and wind have created and how beneficial they are. And guys, if you know anybody looking for work, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, anybody, have them fill out it, go online and fill out an application to any one of the solar companies. You know, start to get into the loop. You know, John, our former director here, right now is in Georgia putting up a solar farm. This is the second one he's done in Georgia, or this is the second time he's been down there. I don't know if it's a different solar farm, but here's a guy that he was watching the show. He took, he took we went up to uh, Brookfield when they had their, they did their solarization. He got all pumped up. He went to Ridley Low School while he was working putting up panels for electric and now the guy's now he's starting to like a gentleman he's making a good living they're flying him down to Georgia he's a precious commodity and why because he took the time to do his homework and apply himself and hopefully for the rest of his life him and his future wife Liz who we met a couple of weeks ago and, uh, you know, he'll be able to take care of his kids and his family because he has a trade. Respectability. Integrity. Honesty. He's a hard worker. <laughs> the Republicans <laughs> love the term hard worker. So the next clip we're going to show you is just how many jobs solar is creating. So, Judy, number 11, please. In the United States, solar energy now provides twice as many jobs as the coal industry. It's creating jobs at a much faster pace than coal. It creates jobs at a rate 17 times faster than the overall economy. 
solar is more rapidly becoming cheaper. We've been covering the increased efficiency of the physical solar panels for many, many years. And yet solar energy still makes up only about 1% of the total power supply in the United States. 40 coal plants were decommissioned in 2016. No new ones were built. And meanwhile, the solar industry broke tons of records for new installations in 2016. 14,000 megawatts of new power from solar were added in 2016. And this is creating many new jobs, including in construction. That's interesting because Donald Trump claims he wants to create construction jobs. It takes about 18 months to build a large scale solar farm and usually local labor is used. And while solar farms are just in specific locations, solar panel installation on the rooftops of, of commercial and residential buildings are creating jobs all over the country. Coal cannot say that about itself. The solar industry is also creating yeah, tons of American jobs in sales and sales and manufacturing. Places. There's actually a report from the Solar Foundation which found that 44 out of 50 states at least doubled their number of solar energy jobs last year. There are very few industries that can claim that. And many of the jobs are also available to people who might otherwise struggle to find a decently paying job. These are the people that Donald Trump claims that he wants to help. An entry level worker without a college degree could possibly double their Roll salary within a year Look from 10 that. bucks an hour for simple manual labor to 20 nice, bucks an hour working within the jobs. solar industry. Trump talked about he loves the uneducated, right? Andrew, Andrew, Andrea, I hope I'm pronouncing the last name right, Lecky, president and executive director of the Solar Foundation, told the site Coexist that, quote, this is just an incredible example of the opportunities that exist for people that need these opportunities the most. You don't see that level of mobility within retail or food service or hospitality or janitorial, which is where most people who don't have higher education are forced to look. The solar industry does provide a new option. Even compared to natural gas, wind and nuclear, solar is creating more jobs. And notably, despite the increased presence of robots in so many industries, solar is still creating jobs. The U.S. currently produces about 39 gigawatts using solar. By some estimates, by 2021, we'll be producing about 100 gigawatts using solar. A study found that the U.S. has the capacity for 200 thousand gigawatts of solar energy production that is 2000 times the estimated 2021 capacity government should be helping solar energy expand tax credits for investment requirements to have solar power on new construction like san francisco's new law requiring all new buildings to have solar panels but we're actually going in the opposite direction we have a president that wants to expand dirty forms of energy like coal that employ increasingly few people and are terrible for the environment. The world is laughing at us. The and world we, is laughing at we us. We can't turn back now and try to save a dying industry when we have new technology here that's not only creating more jobs at this point, but it's also just way greener. There is no argument for coal over solar unless part of your argument is lining the pockets of big political donors and maintaining the kleptocracy and the oligarchical crony capitalist system. That's the only argument for pushing coal over solar because there is no data that supports doing it. And we have someone at the highest position of power who is actually taking it almost like a, a, as something to brag about that he is going to try to restore some coal jobs in West Virginia and he is missing the forest for the trees. Doesn't mean we don't care about those West Virginia workers but they would be way better served being retrained within the solar industry. Meanwhile, the, the president's new federal budget has a 31% cut in the Environmental Protection yes. Agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're actually going to go into the new budget tomorrow. It's absolutely insane. On the bonus show today, Teslas will soon be not much more expensive than your regular old gasoline powered vehicle. A Tesla. Guys, it's true. Tesla's stock price hit close to 300, which puts its market capitalization right behind General Motors. So Tesla Motors is number two, and they're trying harder. 
And guys, this summer, the Model 3 is coming out, the economy model. And I tell you, once that hits, once that hits the streets, it's all over. Because if you've seen anything lately, you've seen how Tesla has pushed all the other car companies to start changing their way of thinking. And, you know, in these clips, one of the, one of the other clips we're going to show you later, one of the biggest uses of oil is from automobiles. Yeah, that's really the number one use of oil, transportation. And now with the electric cars coming in, the Koch brothers, corporate America, and the 1%, and Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, former CEO uh, Exxon, they don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear that we're going to interfere with their profits. We're going to put people and the planet before the profits. <laughs> Rich, what are you doing? You can't put people before profits. <laughs> but guys, you know, we've been having a lot of fun up until now. But the next clip, we're going to show you Bill Nye the Science Guy. And I want to tell you, he really, he crosses the T's and he dots the I's when he talks about global warming and climate change. Some of it might be a little advanced, you know, especially for Uncle Joey, because Uncle Joey, this, this is a little, you know, science is a little too tough for him. But Joey, Bill Nye speaks nice and slowly, so get your kids around and, you know, watch Uncle Rich and maybe, just maybe, we can teach you something. So Judy, let's have clip number 12. Because we can also be part of the solution. Spread your knowledge and your concern with others. That's why we're here, guys. And that's why we surround ourselves with question marks. So that when people say uh, the, the globe isn't warming, you can say to them, where are you getting your information from? Be specific and cite your sources. And guys, most of the time you're going to find out they're getting their information from Fox News. But you know, the reason, one of the reasons why we're doing this show is because on April 29th, there's going to be massive climate marches all over the country. So first we're going to show you the introductory uh, video, and then we're going to show you a couple of stills and show you how you can get involved. So Judy, let's have clip number 13 and introduce everybody to what's going to happen on the 29th. to mark your calendars, guys, April 29th. I don't think you have to wear a hula skirt, though. People to reject Trump. I don't know. Wouldn't that be nice going down there in front of Trump Tower and giving Don the business <laughs> and his wife and their kid and the other phonies that live down there? But guys, uh, the, we're gonna, now we're going to show you a still. So Judy, can you bring up 01, please? And uh, guys, this is the introduction. Uh, you know, this is the, the people's climate... Uh, movement. This is for uh, Washington, D.C., but you see, uh, we resist, we build, we rise. And guys, you can, go on, um, you can go on YouTube or on Google, and you can join the march. And Judy, let's click on the next still, still number two. And guys, what we've done here is um, we, we went further down in the page, and you can see that on the 29th at the New Milford Green at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, there's going to be a rally 
And uh, if there's nothing uh, in Danbury, I might head up to, uh, to New Milford. So if you want to meet Uncle Rich, <laughs> Judy, can you come back to me? If you want to meet Uncle Rich, I'm as plain as the nose on your face. <laughs> and I wear orange so that this way people can't miss me, you know? <laughs> I mean, really. But guys, the next clip we're going to show you is the climate march that happened in 2015 in New York City. And guys, I think there was 400,000 people in, uh, just in New York City. So let's see if this April 29th, if we can break that record. So Judy, let's have clip number 14, please. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets of New York today, demonstrating for action on climate change. It was the largest rally, but certainly not the only one. Similar events were held in more than 160 countries. With the UN summit this week, the message countries. to world leaders was clear. Act now. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Some 300,000 people jammed the streets of New York's west side to demand action on climate change. Holy moly. On a hot, muggy Look day after the Earth's warmest is. summer on record. <laughs> For many marchers, this was a family affair. I think it's the most important thing when I think about the future Let of my the kids children. Involved. It's kind of bleak. Lisa Hoyos, founder Teach of Climate science. Parents, brought her two sons from San Francisco. She wants to move away from coal, oil, and gas, the fossil fuels driving climate change. 100% clean energy, safe energy, what we like to call kids safe, climate safe energy. Tracy Summers and her family live on Maine's coast where they can see the effects of a warming ocean. We see more jellyfish now and see invasions of green crabs that are coming up into our um, bays. Near Morgantown, West Virginia, Lindia Ervelina says getting natural gas out of the ground by fracking is destroying her community. What is the message that you want to send here in New York? I want to send a message, first of all, they consider uh, West Virginia a sacrifice zone. And we are not going down without a fight. We don't want to be anybody's sacrifice zone. This was the marquee event in a worldwide day of action. From Melbourne to Berlin to London, people took to the streets. Rio bathed Christ the Redeemer in a green light. In New York, there were bold-faced names. Former Vice President Al Gore, Mayor Bill de Blasio, and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. There is no plan B because we do not have planet B. The message of this march is aimed directly at world leaders who will meet later this week at the United Nations and then again in Paris next year. That's when countries will try again to reach a global commitment to cut greenhouse gases and stave off what scientists warn are the potentially catastrophic impacts of climate change. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. Look at all those kids, guys. And you know, that's one thing I always say to Uncle Joey. I say, you know, Joe, you want to be a climate denier and you want to stick with the Republican Party. But look at what you're doing to your kids. What are your kids going to say to you years from now? Say, Dad, why didn't you do something? Oh, I, I, I didn't. I, I was a Republican. I wouldn't do anything. The fossil fuel industry needs the money. It's more important than you. Is that what you're going to tell them, Joe? Is that how you're going to look your kids in the eye and say, listen, I put my party before my people? Is that what you're going to do, Joe? Is that what you're going to do? And I got some bad news for Uncle Joey. Because in New York State, his kids are going to be able to get a free college education. So Judy, let's see if we can click on number 16 while we're on a roll. And do you have that? This is for Uncle Joey. Joe, there's no reason your kids have to be as stupid as you. They're going to be able to go to college for free. There's going to be stipulations, but it's going to be for free. Oh, I love you. Can you imagine that? The middle class getting a college education? York. City of love. Unheard of, right, Joe?
Guys, now the coal miners can go to college and learn how to install solar panels. Thank you, Uncle Rich. You're welcome. <laughs> it's simple, isn't it? But God, this is all it is. You know, we socially tell each other what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And the next clip we're going to show you is not only what Denmark has planned, but what Denmark has achieved when it comes to renewable energy. And guys, I tell you, all these Scandinavian countries, they all got their act together. You know, you got Germany, Scandinavia, Denmark, um, Sweden. They, you know, they all get it. Why? Because, you know, look what they've lived through. Look at the wars they've had to live through to fight over oil. We don't have to fight over oil anymore. We got more solar and wind than we need. We got more solar and wind what we know what to do with. We can give it away. But of course, the fossil fuel industry doesn't want to hear that. Why? <laughs> Why else? <laughs> Why does anything get done in this country? It's because of the money. And guys, now we're going to start to show you. And just look how happy everybody is. Everybody that contributed you know, to renewable energy and what a difference it's made and how they're now harvesting the sun and the wind. So Judy, let's have clip number 15, please. As the UN Climate Change Summit comes to a close, one European nation stands out for the strides it has taken to convert from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. That country is Denmark, which aspires over the next 35 years to become the first nation on Earth to run completely on clean energy, including for transportation. In tonight's signature segment, we begin on Samso Island, just west of Copenhagen, to see how that plan is taking effect. News Hour special correspondent Lisa Desai reports. The island of Samso lies nine miles off Denmark's mainland. It's mostly a farming community and home to 4,000 residents who are part of a cutting edge experiment. Good morning. Soren Hermansen is the man most responsible for putting Samso on the map as the world's first island powered 100 percent by renewable energy. Aren't they beautiful guys? The transformation began in the late 1990s. The question would always be, does it cost more than what we have today? Or how do we finance it? Or is it technically difficult? Will it change my daily routines and stuff like that? Okay, so all the smart house thing here is controlled by a computer. As the director of the Samso Energy Academy, Hermanson hosts visitors from around the world, explaining how Samso went from being entirely dependent on imported oil and coal for its electricity to running fully on wind and solar energy. It's producing about 6,000 kilowatt hours per year, hmm. which is the same as we consume uh, in total per year. Oh, right. The main source of power on the island is 21 wind turbines, 11 onshore and 10 offshore. The electricity is all produced from wind turbines today which was a great big effort because, I mean, some of the islanders, they kind of had this image that, wow, maybe the, the island will flip over right. <laughs> because they're so big. Overall, the island produces more energy than it consumes and transmits the excess by cable to mainland Denmark. Samso uses the profit it makes from selling the excess, about $3 million last year, to improve its energy infrastructure. Some of the critics said a wind turbine will never pay back its own cost in its, in, in its lifetime. That's a myth. But most of the island's home heating comes from a different renewable source, biomass or plant-based energy. And the fuel is locally grown straw. We have four district heating plants and they serve about 75% of all heat yeah. heating demands. Hermansen took me to one of those heating facilities. We burn straw in like a big pot mm -hmm. and then cook water and send it around to people. Transforming Samso has cost $80 million over the past decade and a half, a mix of private investment and government subsidies. Hermansen says the biggest challenge wasn't economic or technical, it was social. The farming community should be convinced that they should, they, they should share their land with the wind turbines and, and other owners, and they could either, either be their own owner or they could be cooperative owners with other people. And for the house owners, if you change your heating system to be able to use district heating or 
biomass or solar panels uh, feeding into your, your heating system, then it'll be cheaper and better than the, the previous or the traditional oil boiler uh, that you had in the house before. I needed to show them the money in a way. Show the money to Samso residents like electrician Brianne Kerr, who decided to place a wind turbine in his own backyard. This is your own personal turbine. Yes, it is. And not a lot of people can say they have one in their backyard. Kerr figures the wind turbine saves his family two to $3,000 a year on his electric bill. Everybody is looking here and say, oh, you are so way ahead in our challenge to cut back on fossil fuels. And uh, for us, it's just our everyday life, and, and we feel it's natural. Down the road, farmer Joran Tranber is also energy self-sufficient. I have full uh, up all my good roofs with solar panels. And uh, this house is full up with straw. He owns Look at solar all those panels, panels, part guys. of an offshore wind turbine, <laughs> and another turbine that's right on his property. The solar panels, uh, they pay back in eight years. And so, wah, yeah. Why not try? Instead of just talk, you did action. Yes, and I have earned money on it. He earns money by selling the power he doesn't use back to the Samso utilities. So what are we about to do? Well, we, we intend to climb the turbine. We'll warm up once we start climbing. <laughs> That's right. Can I go in? Yeah, go in. Aluminium, so it, it takes... Before starting up, I put on a safety suit and gloves. It's a 150-foot climb to the top. So one yeah, more step. Yeah. Can you can you reach up here? Time to get to the top. Yeah. It's time yep. for lunch. So that's better. Then you can lift yourself up. With a push of a button, Hermanson opens the door to the nacelle, which houses the gearbox and generator. So I mean, you, you can step up here. Yeah. I ain't stepping up the there. View. You step up there. All right. Whoa. <laughs> this, this, yeah. This is really. Look at that thing. Uh, Whoa. It's similar to a 3,000 horsepower engine. Yeah. So it's a big engine. Samso has become a Look symbol of what Money. Denmark wants for all of its five and a half million people. It's the first country to build wow. massive offshore wind parks load. and has an ambitious plan oh, to run 100% on renewable energy by 2050. No oil, coal, or gas for electricity, heat, or even transportation. The plan was set in motion in Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, 40 years ago, not because of global warming, but because of the 1973 Arab oil embargo. With 99% of its energy then coming from the Middle East, Denmark decided to pursue energy independence. Its thousands of miles of coastline are especially suitable for harnessing wind power. But one drawback is the supply hey. is not consistent. You have on a slacker. day where there's no wind in Denmark. Torben Glar Nielsen is executive vice president of EnergyNet, a government-owned company responsible for Denmark's energy infrastructure. At the heart of the system is an interconnected electrical grid, a sort of energy exchange that links Denmark to its neighbors, Sweden and Norway to the north, and Germany to the south. We have uh, interconnectors to other countries, so when there's no wind, for example, then uh, we can import, and when there's a lot of wind, we can export. EnergyNet is in negotiations to extend the grid to include the Netherlands and the UK, making the market for renewable energy more reliable and competitive. People then can buy the electricity uh, where it's cheapest, so that's very good for the consumers. But not so good for traditional power plants. While on average Denmark produces 40% of its electricity from wind, there are times when it produces more than 100%, and that makes the price of electricity so cheap, coal and gas-fired plants can't compete. One day in September, power plants across the whole country shut down for 24 All hours. All right, shut what them down. A lot of them is that they very early took the step of saying, OK, we have to be part of this instead of against this. So today, for example, the Danish company Dong, they are building offshore wind parks. So instead of just saying we want to stick to our coal-fired power plants, then they have gone into the new business. Beyond developing renewable energy, Denmark is pushing conservation too. To discourage gasoline consumption, Denmark's tax on new cars is among the highest in the world, 180 percent. That encourages Danes to spend more time on two wheels. In fact, here in Copenhagen, one-third of all commutes to work and school are done on bikes. 
While electric cars are not as popular Look here as in guy. other countries like Norway, the Netherlands, Germany, or the US, Denmark offers a big financial incentive to buy electric, waiving that 180% new car tax. Engineers Mads and Ann Luca own two. The better technology. It's much more fun, it's quiet, it's cleaner. Uh, and, yeah. you, and you never lose a race for green light, as you <laughs> <No>. say. <laughs> their appliances are all rated A+. Like a lot of their neighbors, the Lucas have a washing machine, dishwasher, oven, refrigerator, and freezer with maximum energy efficiency. Their lamps use LED bulbs, which use less energy than typical incandescent or fluorescent bulbs. Then it's so efficient that it doesn't get warm. Because their house has solar panels too, the family is very conscious of its energy consumption, tracking it all on their computer. That spike? When the coffee maker went on in the morning. <laughs> While all of this costs them more up front, wild, eh? the Lucas say it saves them money in the long run. And it's the right thing to do. I think it's only naturally that you want to leave a better country for your kids. Yeah. And we also want to do that. Denmark's vision of the future includes smart homes with computers that run appliances when energy demand is lowest and cheapest. Giving to the converter. And extending the smart power grid throughout Europe, from Denmark to Spain, to distribute power when it's really needed on any given day. Back on Samso Island, Soren Hermansen is looking ahead. We should go further because we can. We should develop the technologies because it's necessary and, and we have the possibilities and we should do science and research also to be on the next level of, of, of development uh, to help out the rest of the world uh, and end this transition to, be, to better the climate. Guys, did you notice one thing when they were up on the turbine and they had the doors open and the blades were spinning? Did you notice one thing? They were talking in normal voices. Yet you hear people's autos, wind turbines, they make so much noise, they're deafening, and they give me a headache, and they make the lights go crazy. Guys, you saw it. You heard it. <laughs> Virtually nothing. All right, so Judy, how much time do we have left? Two minutes. Guys, i tell you what. We had so much fun in the beginning of the show. Why don't we play the Sean Spicer Kids clip again? Just Guys, we're going to end the show. You know, we attacked Syria.